everyone and apologies for the short delay. Um, good evening, good morning, um, bienvenidos to all our guests from all around the world. Welcome to the session on um, looking at how we as community psychologists can work better towards gender equality. We have um, an international um, presenter uh, line up for you tonight and um, we're going to each do a short presentation and then um, we will hopefully have some discussion. But before we start, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. For me here in the inner north of Melbourne, that's the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present, future and emerging acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that might be with us here tonight. Um, and it's particularly important to acknowledge that it is NAIDOC week here, which is a week of celebration across Australia to celebrate the history, culture and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, so without further ado, hi Monica, I can see you're with us. So we are, we are all here now. That was that was a bit of a um, beat, wasn't it, all getting here? Um, I'd like to hand over to Heather, actually, who's going to um, introduce uh, the, the, the speakers tonight and um, the context in which this presentation's been put together, which is um, a chapter in a book that Heather um, held up recently on community psychology and pursuit of liberation and well-being, which um, we'd oh, highly recommend. <laughs> Heather, over to you and speakers, you have eight minutes and I will be strict about timing you. Thanks very much, Emma. We had hoped that we would each introduce ourselves, but I think we will go straight into the, the um, actual discussion now. And uh, as Emma mentioned, that uh, the, the, I guess the genesis for this presentation came out of the chapter that several of us um, combined to, to co-author. I think the process started about five years ago, but um, it, so it seems like a long time. And uh, that um, came out of uh, previous editions of the same book, which was uh, Community Psychology Towards Liberation and Wellbeing, was that it? Um, and the original editors were Isaac Prilaltensky and Jeff Nelson, and they were joined then by um, Scott Evans and Manuel Reimer and Stephanie Wright. And Stephanie and and um, and Manuel and and Scott then took over for this third edition as the kind of lead editors with the backup from the the senior colleagues in um, Isaac and Jeffrey um, in Canada, Isaac in in the US, via Argentina, Melbourne, Israel, and um, and Canada. So he's been around. So um, that's the background to the book very briefly. And when we wrote the um, the, the chapter Colin and I were the editors the first time around and uh, then with the third edition we were invited to make it a more international focus and uh, to perhaps respond to it in some slightly different ways and so we um, were able to recruit Ronell and also Stephanie Van Wick from, um, um, Shireen Van Wick from uh, South Africa and, uh, and Monica Maiden Ingram from Indonesia. So we now have five, six co-authors to the chapter, but uh, only four of us are here, to, five co-authors co co and four of them are here tonight, um, or, or this morning from, depending on where you are. Um, we also had uh, Manuel Reimer, who was uh, one of the book's co-editors, said was hoping to join us tonight and Stephanie Reich, but it's about four o'clock in the morning for them. So that was a bit much to ask. Manuel has sent us a message and if I have time in my eight minutes, I'll try and read that out um, because he wanted to speak as a male ally to the work that we were talking about and our key question about how community psychologists can work towards gender to advance gender equity. Um, I want to go back though about 30 years briefly and um, talk about uh, briefly about uh, probably the chapter that really got this conversation underway, not with ourselves, but perhaps with earlier almost generations of community psychologists and feminist community psychologists. And that was an article by Anne Mulvey that many of you might have read. And if you haven't, I suggest you do, because it's still very fresh, which was um, in 1988, she wrote an article called Community Psychology and Feminism, Tensions and Commonalities. And she looked at how those two movements, even though 
in their um, iterations in the 60s and 70s were very much parallel and had very similar values. They didn't seem to have talked to each other very much and that, that was problematic for both, but particularly for community psychology, which was still quite male dominated. So that, uh, um, Anne came to Australia about uh, in 1992, so I got to know her and she's still a very good friend and sends her best wishes. Um, but I think she's still traumatised by the uh, recent happenings in the US and wasn't able to, well, wouldn't have been able to join us anyway because it's four o'clock in the morning, but she certainly is with us in spirit. Anyway, that of course was not the only place in the world where these conversations have taken place and not necessarily the only starting point, but it, it has, it does mean that it spans quite a long period and Colin and I have certainly been talking about it for almost that long ourselves. <clears throat> so the question that we were asked to respond to in, in um, kind of thinking through the chapter was, how the core principles of community psychology might advance gender equity. And in doing that, um, I'll quickly list through some of those principles, but we're not actually going to talk about those explicitly tonight because we want to get onto the examples. But the, um, the principles that we were given, these were given by the editors, and in some ways they, that meant they constrained what we wrote. In other ways, it made it really easy because we had a framework to work from. So we were offered, the, um, in, especially in the early um, iterations of the book, um, several um, traditional principles of community psychology, you know, ecology and complexity in a globalised world, transforming systems, community networking and partnership, social capital, sense of community, prevention, promotion, social change, all very familiar to anybody who's done community psychology any time in the last 40, 50 years. Um, more recently, some of the principles that have come to the fore, probably thanks to feminism and um, decolonization and, 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 and other movements, um, power and empowerment um, and depowerment that Ingrid Huggins often talks about, diversity, marginalization, inclusion, and of course, intersectionality, and then perhaps from post-structuralism, subjectivity and reflexivity. And I can see Colin's face almost saying that's the big word territory because Colin is very good at keeping us down to let's get on with what that really means in our work. So um, in the chapter then we've, we have got some snapshot issues that I think address some, if not all of those principles. And we tried to finish with a visions or values for um, feminist and gender affirming community work. And um, we didn't actually provide an answer to that directly because we always say that feminism is a plant that grows only in its own soil, which um, means, of course, that it's the, the it's always context dependent. But I would I will finish on a, a quote that participants in a symposium on the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, which are now the Sustainable Development Goals on Gender Indicators. Their vision for this was that it's girls in schools, it's labour to, it's being able to plan the kids, owning all our land, aspiring to be prime minister, having roads and water, so that life in the future will be better for our daughters. And we thought that was a pretty good mantra for the kinds of things that we might be envisioning here. So on that note, I'm going to hand pass to who comes next? I think it's Colleen having given her Colleen. a Colleen, yeah, so. Colleen's next. <laughs> Thank you. Colleen, are you happy to introduce yourself? Right. Hi, hello everybody. It's nice to see all the faces lined up, some of the faces and some of the names. Um, I'm Colleen Turner. I've been working um, in a, as a community worker and community psychologist for, I don't know, 30 years. Um, and much of my practice is, is informed by feminism, um, like many of you. Um, and I too would like to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people, or I am, and you guys are all over the world um, on land, lands of a range of peoples. Um, and I too acknowledge that it's NAIDOC week. Um, so my, my topic is, I, I was having a read of our chapter um, today and having a look at the little bit that I wrote and thinking about what I think about that now, a couple of years later. Um, so homelessness is gendered. So I'm not gonna, I'm not going to um, have any slides. I'm just gonna talk at you for eight minutes and Emma's gonna wave at me when I get to seven. Um, 
homelessness is gendered. So given, given we live in a world of patriarchal structures that remain to a greater or lesser degree and in all the various forms that they take in all the different places and countries, um, that's one given in terms of, of where women and their children live. Um, women's access to economic uh, resources are more limited than men's everywhere. Um, and remain that way, although in some places there's some gains and then some losses in the current pandemic. Um, and despite this, this um, diminished access to economic resources, women remain responsible for the care of children and elders, um, often or usually economically as well as, um, as, as carers. And the forms that all of that all of that kind of layering takes are varied, and I've said that. Um, the types of government that that people live within makes a huge difference, um, as do the histories of every single place that people come from and um, live in. And as you know, again, all the layers. So the 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 international scene makes a difference this year. Every all sorts of things have happened to housing for women and for men and for children and for older people in in an, a, an international pandemic. Um, some of those are good. Um, I had my hair cut today. I know that's a kind of sideways question, but across the road from where I had my hair cut, a couple of hundred um, homeless, formerly homeless people have been housed for the duration of the pandemic in Victoria. So for six months, those people who would have been living on the streets are living in very comfortable accommodation in um, Airbnbs. Um, so the, the big question is how to operationalize secure and or safe housing for women and children, for all women and children is a massive question. There are more massive questions that um, Monica and Renal will, will address, but housing in, is it in itself. Housing that is secure, that's, that's one issue. Housing that is safe is another issue. Um, first world countries often, mostly, have welfare and safety nets, um, often including un, unemployment benefits and in surprisingly many countries, payments for sole parents. So parents who are um, looking after children without without a partner. Um, I was surprised when we did a bit of a review of which countries have such such benefits and which ones don't, and it, it doesn't align to the sort of government or anything else except individual small histories. So Australia's had it since 1975, and a very good thing too. Um, However, those safety nets themselves are based on the same ideologies of, of, the, of the particular country and the particular history that can stigmatise, blame and punish women. So I was, I was going to do a little kind of broad analysis and then give you two, two vignettes from my own experience. Um, so in Australia, and this is only Australia and it will be different from other places, but the, the kind of you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't around access to economic resources and or secure housing are uh, around in most countries. Um, in Australia, they get stuck in a terrible continuum, conundrum. If they have a violent and or if they're in a violent and or controlling relationship, not an unusual thing for women, um, they could lose access to finances and support for their children if they leave. Um, but if they stay, and it's and it's difficult to safety safely safely and well parent from insecure accommodation. So if 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 um, your finances are are controlled by the person that is your partner and the parent of the other parent of your child, then if you leave, you lose access to the, those. However, in Australia, if you stay um, and the violence continues, then quite rightly, um, child, child protection agencies are 
worried and women can be can lose access to their children for not not protecting the, the children from that violence. So it's a kind of absolute double bind of of two two agencies, two systems set up for the protection of women and children and the community more generally that can, in particular circumstances, leave people in a bind that's that's almost impossible to, to get out of. And in either case, they may lose their children. Um, so in other countries, for example, South Sudan, such safety, safety nets don't exist. Um, and therefore women and children um, don't, have, don't have access to often any um, financial um, resources um, and therefore housing resources and safety. This is particularly the case in countries that have um, unstable governments and all sorts of other things going on. Um, so women and children are, are the most vulnerable to extreme poverty and to lack of access to things like education. So my example from South Sudan from a few years ago, I hope things have improved, but from 2016, 20% of all children got to go to even primary school. And of those 20%, pardon, pardon the funny mathematical analogy, 19 of them were men, 19 of them were boys. So that very, very few women in that country, okay, thank you, are able to do that. All right, one minute. How to operationalize all those, all of those things. Every country's done it differently um, with greater or less success. So, you know, how does that, how does that impact on the choice of somebody who needs to leave home this afternoon, Friday afternoon, um, with her small, three small children immediately because she's in immediate danger and she has no money on and no resources. Now, I'm, I know this is a fairly bleak picture and there are services and there are programs and many of them do absolutely amazing work with the, exactly that sort of scenario um, and the sort of scenario that you would find in South Sudan as well. All I'm, all I'm wanting to do is paint a picture of the complexity of the problem of housing and Emma's waved her fingers at me and that's where I'll leave it. Thank you, Colleen. Um, hopefully there'll be a bit of time at, at the end for people to maybe ask you a bit more about that because I know there's a lot more in the chapter that you've covered and um, we could have more of a conversation about that. But I'm going to hand over to Monica now because I know that she's um, going to talk about uh, diversity, marginalisation, inclusion and intersectionality. Mm. Monica, nice to see you again too. Good to see you, Emma. Thank you. And hi, everyone. Um, my name is Monica. I'm joining from Yogyakarta, Indonesia. And uh, I wrote the section uh, on the book chapter that Heather introduced in the beginning when I was uh, doing my uh, doctoral study. And now I'm joining this conversation uh, from the position as a lecturer using that, ch that chapter to facilitate, uh, to facilitate a, a course uh, at an undergraduate program uh, of psychology in Sanata Dharma University in Yogyakarta. Actually, my teaching partner is also joining us right now in this conversation, Eduard Theodorus. Hopefully, uh, later he would like to share his reflections uh, as well. Uh, so that's Edward. Hello, Edward. Uh, and um, I would like to uh, share just one slide just to uh, help me uh, to ensure that I remember all the main thoughts and reflections that I would like to bring into the conversation. Has it come through all right, the slide? Okay, thank you. So um, I would like to reflect on this question from my current context as 
a lecturer in an undergraduate program of psychology in Indonesia. Uh, particularly, I would like to share how some key notions of community psychology and feminism have enabled me to design a, a course which hopefully is more responsive to the idea of social justice and, and solidarity. So uh, just a brief description about the course. Um, the name of the course is Basic Principles of Psychological Intervention. Uh, the main aim of this course is to introduce to the students some basic concepts and considerations for designing and implementing psychological interventions at various levels from the traditional uh, psychological counseling types of intervention at the individual level up to types of uh, psychological works which are more targeted for promoting structural or social changes. Uh, one of the expected uh, learning outcome is to enable the students to critically look at how macro determinants uh, like social, cultural, economic, uh, political factors may shape uh, people's psychological conditions at various levels and domains, including in what are commonly uh, perceived as, as personal issues or problems. Uh, it is in relation to this expected uh, outcome that I find the concept of intersectionality as proposed um, by feminism is really useful in promoting students' reflections of their own uh, experiences as young people and who mostly come from uh, middle class backgrounds. Uh, I find that by bringing the concept of intersectionality into the course, uh, I can better identify the areas where my students can be readily aware of how gender constructions can and have shaped what they generally perceive uh, as the psychological issues of young people in nowadays eras, issues like body normativity, uh, online bullying, uh, authentic, authentic self-actualization. But at the same time, uh, this concept also enables me uh, to identify areas where my students uh, tend to be less aware of the gendered constructions of people's experiences. Uh, this is particularly evident in the way uh, the students responded to issues which are usually outside the concerns of those belong to the middle class groups. Uh, for example, when I ask them to list types of types or examples of gender inequality, which are commonly found in our society, uh, students hardly mention about job related inequality. They appear to believe that workplace is an area where gender inequality is no longer an issue as there are already equal access and opportunities for women and men in various domains of work life. It is not until I share some reports and documentations regarding sexual harassment and violence commonly experienced by Indonesian female workers uh, particularly those who work as factory laborers, that my student uh, get, um, is this thing really happening kind of uh, reactions. So uh, this kind of reaction is really useful to invite further discussion and interrogation on how Indone Indonesian psychologist alienation from notion of class may obscure my students' awareness of the normalized uh, gender-based discrimination and marginalization in our society. So it is from such a micro observation that I think linking community psychology's emphasis on structural factors like social class uh, and the feminism notion of intersectionality can be a kind of entry point for fostering shared awareness 
on the issue of social justice and, and solidarity. So that's uh, a brief reflection to start our conversation. Emma, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And so far, you're going to get the prize for going under the eight minutes. So well done. And it's wonderful to see where the chapter and the textbook has, has gone in relation to you using it for your teaching and learning. And um, very interesting to hear some of those student reflections and where they fit within the context of the chapter too. So thanks a lot, Monica. Um, without further ado, I'm going to now hand you over to Renell, who is going to talk about the principles of power, empowerment and depowerment, equality and equity, amongst other things, in the context of South Africa and equity in higher education. So over to you, Renell. Thanks so much, uh, Emma. Um, it really is great to be here. Um, let me just uh, set my uh, clock so that I don't um, go over um, and so on. Right, I'm, I'm Ronel Karolison. I'm a, a clinically trained community psychologist. Um, and for my sins, I I've com just completed my fourth year of being the Vice Dean of Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Education um, at the University of Stellenbosch um, in Cape Town. Um, well, about an hour's drive outside of Cape Town. So today I'm just going to tell two stories um, or, or stories about two contexts very briefly, which um, uh, bring together a number of those um, uh, concepts that we, we um, focused on. So the two stories I tell come from very, two very different contexts. Some of my personal experiences in academia as a black South African woman. And um, then secondly, um, a, uh, you know, a story about um, so-called colored or girls, adolescent girls labeled as colored living in a peri-urban urban South African community um, and a uh, incredibly marginalized community. And these girls um, are the girls of farm workers. Now, both examples illustrate concepts of depowerment and power, subjectivities and reflexivity, which is so central to, um, to thinking through, um, you know, the work we do, um, particularly um, as to how, when, as, um, when we think about how they relate to gender. Uh, the second example is uh, described in some detail um, and discussed in some detail in the book chapter. So the first um, example that I want to talk about is locating myself as a black woman in higher education. Um, black women's oppression in academia is well recorded in the literature. Over and above developing scholarly competencies we also have to develop um, emotional and psychological shields against cumulative effects of patriarchy, racism, and um, class oppression, um, and many other forms of oppression. The constant vigilance and healthy paranoia, which uh, serves as a protective radar, often results in racial battle fatigue, and I would add sexist and class battle fatigue, and, and, and. The sense that one always has that you have to be one step ahead. Let me give you an example. At least 12 years ago, um, I had a very uh, interesting experience and it remains vivid in my mind. And I thought I'll speak to it because um, uh, we are again at a community psychology conference. I was about to finish my PhD i have been asked to serve on an international scientific conference committee in community psychology when I received the official flyer on the event. I noticed that I was referred to as Dr. Carolison. My protective radar immediately kicked in and I wrote a letter to the international organizer indicating that they had made a mistake. Indeed, I wasn't Dr. Carolison yet. I sent a copy of this letter to my chair and he told me not to worry and that everybody at some time gets called a doctor. My radar was not wrong. Approximately a month after this email event and the week before I had to do my doctoral oral exam, an anonymous letter was slipped under 
the departmental chair's door. He was also my supervisor. I suggest in a sinister way that he, uh, the letter suggested in a sinister way that I was misrepresenting myself and that I was dishonest. Perhaps this was a response to my finishing my PhD in three years, the minimum time that we allocated. My supervisor withheld the note from me until after I'd finished my oral exam. Why does this stand out? It was not the only experience. Another one was the often, often the double-edged or backhanded compliment, but you not an affirmative action candidate, a constant reminder that mine was a body out of place. As uh, Jasper Puar talks about in a book, Space Invaders, and to this, I often replied, indeed, I am. I would not have been appointed at Stellenbosch University or any university for, ma for that matter if legislation didn't demand it at the time. The assumption here was that normative notions of affirmative action um, cast black people like myself within a deficit discourse where black people are perceived to be less competent and not appointed on so-called merit. There are yet others who may resist and accommodate to navigate every, everyday challenges, and they often oscillate between ambiguity and constructive um, self-definition. I just want to give one example. There are many of my colleagues who I call leave the university while they stay. So many, many of my colleagues, black colleagues, leave academia while being involved in, in institutions. What do I mean by that? They do not physically leave, but they withdraw into their research projects and do not involve themselves in broader engagement with the university um, and, and, and engage in nothing else that does not further their research project. This process, however, is significantly rewarded so that that which signifies their psychic distress also becomes their reward. What, <laughs> what an interesting uh, conf conf conflictual situation. So the context of higher education thus form, affirmed this form of alienation. The second example I want to speak to is um, how young um, adolescent girls resist and accommodate dominant discourses. In the post-1994 democratic South Africa, dominant discourses of national social inclusion suggest that South African children are born free um, and experience few impacts of legislated inequity in South Af Africa. Um, a few of my colleagues and I explored how a group of colored adolescent girls talked about the intersectional experiences of race, gender, and class in their school communities. The girls' experiences represented a counter-narrative to the inclusionary discourse associated with rainbowism. Um, and we interviewed them in focus groups. And, and in, despite having grown up in a democratic South Africa, the girls aged 13 to 15 were found to have class and gendered experiences which were internalized and expressed as racialized experiences. They associated middle-class lifestyles with whiteness. One participant gave examples of upper middle-class colored men such as sports stars and politicians um, marrying white women precisely because they had money and had acculturated themselves to becoming more desirable to white women uh, through financially acquired middle-class power. The responses implied um, the, the one, one of the participants um, uh, suggested that she and her peers would never be able to consider marrying these middle class colored men because these men aspired both to whiteness and to marrying white women. They also said that middle class colored children in their community thought they were white and better than themselves because they attended schools that were previously white. They were caught in this bind, these girls, of both idealizing and rejecting whiteness. They made observations, for example, that white people supported their children in further post-school ed education, worked harder and were wealthy, wealthier. In contrast, the work ethic of colored people was questioned, some girls suggesting applications of a stereotype that colored people were lazy and just get pregnant at school. So this kind of comment reinscribed negative microaggressions to colored people like themselves until another girl in the group rejected this view. She claimed that merit does not exist because inheritance has given white people farms and property 
and that white people even buy drugs in their community. Now, it's very interesting that this shocked girls because they could not believe that some people were, were drug users. So it, it goes on and on, but I think one of the key issues that we then um, talk about is how um, it's important that when we work in anti-oppressive ways, we should engage um, school-going um, pu uh, pupils on issues of power so that we may start to build on the beginnings of resistance that are clearing these goals responses. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Renelle. There's um, a lot there in that eight minutes to, to think about and contemplate. Um, I am I'm thinking now we've got, I've, I don't know, Emma, if you're there as our host, the other Emma, um, just to see if we've got a bit longer seeing we started a bit later, but um, if not, then I think we've probably got about 16 minutes left. And given we've got 23 of us on the call, possibly breakout groups will be going to be work. Heather, what are your thoughts at this point? Um, my only concern about that is whether that would work for our, for our interpreters. Is that going to be a problem if we break into groups, small groups? Um, um, sorry, Heather, it's Emmy here from the events team. So, yeah, the interpreters wouldn't be able to interpret in the breakout rooms, unfortunately. Okay. okay. So let's stick with the big group then. And um, I'm sure yeah. there's some comments or questions. So I'm happy to open it up now if you'd like to put a question or comment in the chat I can read it out or if you would like to put your hand up or take your camera off I will attempt to see you um, and feel free our presenters to comment or ask a question of each other as well um, my name is Angela I'm sorry I, my computer doesn't recognize the camera. Um, That's okay, Angela. We can um, hear you. I'm a student at BU. Uh, I just recently uh, completed um, uh, my thesis in doing an intersectionality analysis on experiences uh, of looking employment and education on South Sudanese women in Melbourne, which was really interesting. And now that you mentioned Ronell and how many of the experiences and accounts were in shock that they accepted that there was a gender difference between their parents and them and the young generation but it was also the acknowledgement that uh, now men and women were equal and that now men were experiencing bigger problems because they were seeing um, with the bigger violence and social issues but it, I had this feeling that it was that denial that women um, kind of like the balance went on the other side. Women stopped saying, oh, it's not about gender. It's now about men that are also experiencing. So we're equal, not in the way of opportunities, but we're also equal on the way of how we're being disadvantaged. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to conceptualize that and how to um, Hmm. So, Renelle, I think that question was for you. Um, so, if you wanted to take it. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, I, I think that's a very important question. Um, I think, um, you know, it's a, it's a question that cuts across issues of gender, issues of race. Um, uh, you know, how do we, um, you know, I think in, in terms of race, um, often the, the issue is that um, we minimize uh, the, the inputs and the efforts of black people when, when white people uh, start, um, um, you know, in, you know, taking over and not in fact um, working as allies. So I guess, um, and I'm, that's really putting it simply, it's a lot more complex than that, but the same issues um, e exist about this new field of, of masculinities um, studies, because I think that is what, you, what you're speaking to. Now, um, to, to be honest, I think it's a very important um, uh, field. I think um, if one thinks, um, for example, of gender-based violence, um, one of the biggest arguments um, has been that um, perhaps one of the, 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 the challenges of, of the, the years, decades and decades of work 
of gender-based violence is that the focus has been on working with women, um, whereas men are <laughs> overwhelmingly um, the perpetrators and perhaps some of the focus needs to lie there. And I think for in that kind of example, uh, there's a lot of work that masculinities can do. I know um, one of my colleagues um, uh, in, in psychology, Capano Rotella, has been working uh, a, a lot in this area and, and has been doing workshops with men, workshops with young boys, um, um, and in fact, writing extensively about it. Um, and I know he's not the only person, but certainly one of the, the, the more significant people um, in South Africa writing about it. So uh, in short, yes, I think there is a place um, for, for masculinity studies um, to work alongside um, uh, critical feminist um, work in the area um, of, of gender. Heather, I think you wanted to... I thought that might be a good moment for me to actually, um, and, and it would be good to hear from Edward too, but I might just um, segue into some of the messages that Manuel has sent us, if I can um, read them briefly, because it really speaks to what Renal was just talking about now. But what he said to us is, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't be there live in person with you to share my thoughts on, on this question, but I'm writing these notes um, and I'm, I'm in my apron making dinner for my partner and, and myself. Uh, and I had the good luck of having been raised in Germany by a mother who embraced the feminist movement in the 60s and 70s and a father who did the work necessary to shed most forms of toxic masculinity that he was imbued with as a child. And this significantly expanded my possibility space to use the language of German critical psychology. That is because of the work that my parents and others of their generation did, I was able to work as a childcare provider in a domestic violence shelter, I can make myself and others tasty meals, I can cry when I watch a sentimental movie, I can express my emotions and have more healthy relationships with my partner and my female friends. Um, and I could go on and on, but the point is I'm a better and happier person because of changes in the relationship between the two prominent genders in German society and within the family I grew up in. I'm sharing this because I believe that one way community psychologists can work better towards gender equity is by building the case for it amongst those who are profiting from the current inequity. And then he talks, and this is a little bit theoretical, but I think I can get it quickly. He says, German critical psychology differentiates between restrictive action potence and generalized action potence, um, which is a useful differentiation in this place, a space. Action potence can be understood as agency and restrictive action potency is the level of my agency within the current system with all its limitations. So clearly in current circumstances, a man, I have more action potence than most of my female friends and colleagues. Um, and it may be difficult for you to convince me to give that up, but the idea of generalized action potence is a system transformation towards a society that provides an expanded possibility space for everybody including those previously marginalized and thus a higher level of agency for me and for others as well. Um, and so he goes on to talk about asking a, a black activist, um, uh, you know, who argued that white folk have to do the work to reduce racial injustice and which I, he said, I agree with, but I asked him why they would want to do that. If that means giving up power that gives them the edge in a competitive neoliberal system. And he thinks that we need to be asking the same question and then going, I guess his own answer to that question is that equality benefits everyone so that if we can do it in a way, we're not talking about winners and losers, but things that raise us all. Um, but there will be some losses sometimes, you know, uh, I think that uh, the more powerful group does need to be a bit depowered as even Ingrid Hugens would say, and that can be painful. Um, and it can be particularly painful for men whose, whose grip on things is a bit fragile, who, and that often happens for working class men who, who risk losing, feel, perceive that they're going to lose out to migrants in, in jobs that, you know, casual work and marginal work and so forth. Um, so anyway, I'm just throwing my own bit in there as well as, as Manuel, so I'll stop there. But that was his contribution, and he just wanted to thank us for letting him share his thoughts um, and wish us a great conference. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. And there's a comment in there from um, Rigma to say that they are currently completing their placement and looking at engaging fathers for healthy masculinities and looking at it through the prevention of violence against women lens. And it's very valuable work. And they are learning a lot about this space. 
Thank you, Rigma, for that comment. Um, was there any other comments or questions? Colleen, did you want to respond to that? I was going to respond with a little bit of a question. Um, I worked on a project um, with um, a range of, um, so, there, so it was a national based project, an action research project that had 20 sub projects. Um, and those, those projects were all doing different things, but ours was a playgroup kind of model, but there were other ones looking at all sorts of things. One of the things that was fascinating though was in the first year um, of the project, it really only focused on, it focused on women and children. And the second and third years, it, it added men and fathers into the group. The thing that was fascinating was that the gender stereotypes immediately kicked in and the women in the group started being either silent or, silent or deferential. So my question is, how do we stop? And I don't think it's altogether about women changing their behaviour, but but the power, the power um, sort of differences occur even at that level. And in Australia on Monday night, we had um, a, 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 a television show that showed the immense hypocrisy of some of our national leaders who said one thing about gender equity and behaved in completely the opposite way. So that, those sorts of things are still happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about A, hypocrisy and B, um, you know, privileging and silencing even in those kind of fields? Thanks, Donna. I, I see we, we have a question from, from Charlie that's that's in the in the chat box that picks up on some of the on the on the question of our using sort of binary language. And I, I'm aware that we have been mainly talking about men and women. Uh, I, we were challenged in writing rewriting the textbook to address that question, Charlie. And I, I'd be interested in your response to how well we've done it in the chapter. We haven't done it very well tonight. Um, we were assisted by by Claire Waitman in uh, reviewing a lot of the language we used and trying to make it less binary and to um, acknowledge that um, that we were talking about um, a range of gender range of gendered experiences but uh, in in the broadest terms I think we are still kind of I think probably coming to terms and certainly my generation has probably struggled with this because it took a while to you know, for feminism to get on the bat and to talk about women having needs. And so it's a little difficult sometimes to let that go and think there's a, a broader range of identities involved. Um, but I'm certainly open to that conversation. And I'd like to know if you have a chance to read the chapter, how you think we've actually managed it. But we probably haven't done that very well tonight. Mm. Thanks, Heather. And Charlie said that they will be interested to read it. <laughs> a chapter <laughs> yeah and please do tell me what you think because um as i say it's it's, it's relatively new for me and uh, and quite challenging um but i i also don't want to be somebody who imposes the, the struggles that my generation had and say the next generation has to fight the same ones i think that everyone's got to construct um what are the big challenges for them in the context they're in yeah um, I've got a comment here from Carolyn Kagan. Um, the inclusion of gender diversity in the conversation and the practices of community psychology highlights the importance of what we are really talking about is power. And this cannot be separated from the power of capital and of neoliberal ideology, which is pervasive. Would anyone like to respond to that? Or oh, Carol, would you like to? further your comment or question. It's great to have you here, Carolyn, too. Hi. <laughs> I wonder if we could hear from Edward. Uh, Monica mentioned that she was going to invite her colleague to say a little bit, a bit about his experience of, of teaching the course in, in, in Jogjakarta. So um, we could put you on the spot, Edward, if you're feeling ready for that. I, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I uh, I taught a course with with Monica, and we we thought about um, interventions uh, to community. And um, from my experience, 
um, well, I don't have a lot of experience actually, but from my students, um, when uh, after we, we did the course, uh, I think they had um, some en enlightenment that, that, that the gender problems uh, are not uh, a simple problem. Uh, usually, um, our students, uh, I mean, they, they, they think that the intervention should be uh, a moral and, and religious. That, that's the dominant discourse uh, of at least my students that I experienced. Then after the course, they, they, they have some, some, some ideas that, that uh, it is not uh, gender problems in, in our society, in Indonesian society, it's not, it's not that, that simple, that easy then, well, I hope that they, they learn something from it. Uh, that is from the topic. Um, from from the experience, um, many of my female students um, have low self-esteem. I mean, um, they have to be uh, supported to 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 be what do you call it? Um, to trust in their in 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 their selves and 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 their uh, uh, competency. So, uh, what I did is, um, I'm, I'm, I have been supporting uh, female students uh, if they they want to express opinion. I, I try to uh, to articulate it and to support them. So that I think that's my experience in teaching mm -hmm. uh, about gender issues. So I imagine that it's great modeling to have the two of you teaching that together. Um, yeah. We have to finish probably soon, but I was wondering if Colleen could also, I, I heard that uh, Angela was from, I think you said you were from South Sudan. And I know that Colleen um, has had some experiences with the South Sudanese community in, in Melbourne and also visited South Sudan and uh, has expressed the view to me at times that um, those South Sudanese women are going to rule the world one day because they're very, they, they really um, take things on. Um, and I don't know if that's something you want to pick up on, Colin. We should probably finish up, but it just struck me when Angela was speaking before that you had made that comment. Thank you. Clarify, sorry, I've been um, working with the South Sudanese community, but I'm from Colombia in South America. Oh, I beg your, sorry, Angela, I beg your pardon, yeah. But That's good. But I know. I think we are going to roll the world. Yeah, you agree. Fire. I, I would, sorry, we're, we're having a dog emergency in the background, but um, I, would, I would say that the South Sudanese women are strong and organized and clever um, and have have like many women and many um, gender diverse people across the world struggle in all sorts of ways and that struggle seems to have made them stronger and more determined um, so I I'm thinking here of my friend Rachel Amour Patch who who is a minister in the South Sudanese in a province of the South province, the province of Bor, I believe, if I'm correct. I've been there, but I'm never quite sure of the layers. Um, and the the kind of work that she's been doing both here and in Melbourne, backwards and forwards. And I'm sure Angela's got heaps of experiences like that as well. So, you know, um, I think it's just a, an example of women will rule the world and uh, and the more help we we get, and the more support we give each other across all of the factors that that stop those ruling of the world in good ways, um, the better. Sorry, that's not very eloquent, but there you go. It's enough. Renelle, did you have something to say before we finish up? Um, I think we've probably got a few extra minutes given we started a bit late. <laughs> No. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm sure you all agree that was um, 
worth persisting for. Um, Carolyn's just put one last comment in. I do wonder why it seems to be so hard for community psychology as a discipline to embrace feminist thinking. Mm. I think that's probably a good question to finish up on and think about. I'm not sure that we've solved that in this chapter or this presentation, but um, I think we've made a start. <laughs> Maybe if he wants to say something, if Karen wants to say something. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. I mean, we did start a bit later, so I guess if you do need to leave, leave. But um, otherwise, we'd love to hear from you, Carolyn. No, I'm not sure if she can hear me. Sorry, did oh, you want to say something? Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Do you have any thoughts on the question you posed to all of us? <laughs> <laughs> what, that last one? Yeah. <laughs> oh, just in a I few minutes. <laughs> it's just such a struggle. Yeah. yeah. Look, at, look at this symposium. Where are the men? Why is mm. this a women's issue? Why is discussing mm. gender issues? A women's issue. That's with apologies to Edward. Um, but <laughs> it, it, what's kind of interesting to me, because having been around for a while and seen some of the trends, is the wholesale embracing of decolonialism and decolonial thinking and the necessity to decolonize our, our language and our theories and our practices. And a complete blind spot in seeing what that implies for feminism, apart from, from feminists, which I think is really kind of interesting and fascinating, and I don't have an answer to it. Yeah. Um, it's just a, a struggle that will continue. I, th I think your point about, in, um, the one you made earlier about neoliberalism is, is very apposite on that too, because um, somebody said in one of the, um, Oh, I think one of the um, sessions yesterday that was something like, uh, um, oh, I think it was Susie Burke today actually in her session said something about the, 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 the most, there's something like a huge number of the gender, the, the gender, sorry, the um, carbon emissions are actually as, are done by about 20 companies in the whole world. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and yet we focus a lot on individual behavior and you know what we're doing, but actually if we're able to go straight to the sources of power, but the sources of power also run. One of the good things that you might like to know is that, that they, one of the things that's happened in the last few weeks is that Kevin Rudd, former prime minister, who I don't have a lot of time for for other reasons, but has initiated a, a petition for a Royal Commission into the power of the Murdoch um, uh, press in Australia or in terms or of, of, of media diversity in general and he got half a million or more signatures and they actually think they might have to at least go through the motions of having some sort of inquiry and the gov government would definitely not want to do that but uh, it's been such a powerful and it's been taken up also by Malcolm Turnbull so two former prime ministers because it's just so toxic and it's interesting that the three that in the UK the US and Australia um Murdoch is particularly dominant and you look at the kinds of governments that we've got and they are not in New Zealand or Canada, um, which is, I'm just talking about white, um, you know, you're speaking countries that are comparable, but I think it's a very interesting um, comment on how those power dynamics play out. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think too, though, we mustn't kind of deny our history that patriarchy precedes neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. And... We can't just hide under the the, you know, the current dominance of that particular ideology when we're thinking about gender issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there's, there's there's something fundamental about um, the patriarch <coughs> the analysis of patriarchy and its links with other ideologies mm -hmm. that we kind of need to grapple with. Mm -hmm. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> there is just one other thing that hasn't come up in, well, it did come up a bit, I think, in Colleen's talk. 
that has really been highlighted um, through, by the pandemic and is kind of virtually invisible in community psychology, and that is the ethic of care. Not just care for people, um, but care for things and care for the environment and so on. But the, the whole notion of, of care and caring, which is a, certainly a feminist issue, whether I'm not sure whether it's a, mm -hmm. quite the same way, it's a gender issue, but, it, but it, it seems to me that that's something that is pretty invisible in mainstream community psychology as well. I think one of the reasons for that is also because it's tried to distinguish itself from clinical psychology and from individual caring, as you say, and, and such, and sort of look at systems, but then the systems end up looking really dry and and devoid of of those that ethic of care, as you say, and and, and uh, that's that's where, it, for me, it's been very useful to be able to kind of, I've always, people get sick of my saying that my home place is in psychology, our community psychology, and feminist psychology or particularly the women in psychology group within the APS but mm. to me they I learn a lot from both because the women in psychology group is much more um, most of them are um, a small c clinical psychology practitioners rather than theorists and and you get a lot of heart, heart and warmth but not always a lot of systems analysis there so it's a bit of both. Um, Ronelle you were waving saying something to say something. I mean, I think I, I completely agree with you. And I think what we what what is really absent in uh, community psychology is the whole notion of, of the politics of the politics of care, which is different from caring, um, which uh, I think, um, you know, a whole lot of, um, of a number of uh, feminist philosophers have written about quite ex extensively. Um, and I think what is what is challenging for the field of community psychology, so to speak, is that we, we don't work in interdisciplinary ways as much as we should. Um, because I think um, when the politics of care can, can meet with community psychology, I think there is so much um, value in, in us holding up those two lenses and actually seeing the, the points of contact. Um, and I think that will, um, uh, you know, significantly, uh, you know, be able to um, uh, help our, our analyses of, of power, but also our analyses of, well, okay, what do we do when we know all of this? Because I think it's distinctly different from individualized notions of care when we think about the politics of care. Mm -hmm. We probably have to finish up, I guess, don't we, Emma? Where's Emma? Okay, I've lost you. Yes, I'm here, Heather. I'm, um, we do need to finish up soon, if that's possible. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> at this one, we've got two Emmas. We've got Emma as host and Emma as chair. So Emma has spoken. <laughs> <laughs> you there, Emma Sampson? I think we might have lost our chair. Um, so we probably should finish up there. And uh, it's it, really, we've just got going, haven't we? Um, and what happens is that every time we have one of these conferences, we have a two year gap and we come back and start all over again. Although I always, I like to feel like we've moved a little bit forward and some of the things that have been mentioned tonight are not things that have come up when we were in, you know, Chile two years ago and in Durban four years ago and so forth. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, it's, 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 we always have talk about staying in touch in between and unless we have a chapter to write, which has forced us to stay in touch, we don't always do that. But um, yeah, um, we'd love to actually get some feedback from people like Charlie and Carolyn and others on the chapter that we did write for the, for the text. It's not the only way to do it, but it's a great way that if you do read it and you can tell us you know, um, whether that's helpful to your teaching or your practice or your thinking on some of these issues. Um, the other chapter that Colin and I were involved in and, and also Emma and, um, and Monica and Catherine Darcy was the one um, in the, um, what was it called? The Handbook of Community Psychology, the APA one, which came out a little bit earlier. It has some overlap with this, but it's approached from a somewhat different angle. I don't know which is the better in a way. I think that there were constraints in the way that we were invited to put this together. 
Um, and Monica says that she's leaving the conversation with a lot of questions to contemplate on. <laughs> and Monica, you're you are somebody who always makes me think about things. Um, but yeah, so anyway, feel free to let us know. You, we're not hard to track down. And um, it, thank you very much for hanging in there. For those of you for whom it's after 9 p.m. or for those of you who are just getting up in the morning, what time is it there, Ronell? It's quarter past 12 midday. Oh, it's your lunchtime then. <laughs> okay thank you all thank you and that's great to see you here thank you thanks everybody bye take care thank you <laughs>